He's a uh, very hard-bitten, tough journalist, and uh, we're good mates. But he, what he said on that story, on that program, was true. He was texting me as he was reading the book, and he was asking me about different sections of it and um, reacting to different bits and pieces of it. And uh, so that was uh, that was fabulous. And of course. Um, he is a very honest man, so he does tell you what he thinks. One of the great things about Andrew Bold is you never die wondering what he thought about anything. So if he thinks something is crook, he'll tell you that. And if he thinks it's good, he'll tell you that too. So I, I didn't know he was going to say uh, such splendid and wonderful things. And I hope we do get a chance to have another discussion uh, about it on TV. But maybe maybe that five or six or seven minutes, wherever long the segment was, is um, said everything that needed to be said anyway, you know. Mm. And uh, your last book, uh, God is Good for You. Did I get the title right? Yeah, God, God is Good for You. Yeah, God is Good for You. That was your best selling book to date, wasn't it? It was. So that was my seventh book. And uh, <clears throat> I've been a foreign editor for 20 years. I was a foreign correspondent in Beijing and Washington way back in the 1980s. I've been a journalist for 42, 43 years. And um, most of my books have been about international relations, foreign affairs. Asian politics. I wrote one book about the US-Australia alliance. I wrote a, a memoir a few years ago when we were young and foolish. And that got me started on this journey writing about God, because in the memoir, I kind of owned up to the fact that I was a Christian believer, but it wasn't the main part of the book. But I went to a whole lot of writers' festivals, and I was astonished that in all the writers' festivals I went to, there was not a single book from a pro-Christian or a pro-Jewish point of view and I thought wow that's really strange that's uh, how can that be in our culture leaving aside any divine question how can our culture be whiting out the, you know the very influence that shaped the culture so uh, I thought well I'll I'll make a um, an effort to you know pour my thimble full of uh, knowledge into the great ocean and then right before the book was published I had a complete crisis of confidence that anyone would buy it at all I thought, you know, there are uh, there are better Christian writers than me, and uh, this is nothing like anything I've ever written before. Um, but you know, uh, uh, everything just worked out very kindly, and um, people responded nicely to the book. I must say, I had a few atheists respond very nicely to the book. Uh, Richard Glover, the ABC broadcaster, and Bob Carr, and a few others. So, um, so I was a little bit nervous about it, but it turned out to be a terrific experience, really. And what's the response so far to the book? Well, to the new one, I've had uh, a terrific response. And um, you feel funny saying it because it's not really, it's not a response to me. It's a response to the truths in the book. And, um, you know, Warwick, I've worked out a way to be the very best in your field. Enter a field in which there are no other participants at all. And there are no other, there are no other sort of secular journalist books about uh, God and Christianity. So I'm both the best and the worst in this particular field. And um, uh, I've had surprisingly friendly encounters, as I say, uh, with atheists about it on the ABC. Lovely response from Christians. I very consciously try to write from that C.S. Lewis mere Christianity perspective where any Christian who can sign up to the Apostles' Creed, so I, I don't get into the denominational issues, you know, where you know, denominations might disagree with each other over fine points of theology. I'm just trying to deal with the the heart of Christianity. And the last book was a was an essay really in part about <clears throat> how logical and rational and sensible it is to believe in God. This book is about how logical and sensible and rational it is to believe in the New Testament. And it was provoked partly because one person uh, in response to the last book said to me very conscientiously, he said, look, this is not a bad effort about why belief in God is rational and so on, but where is the living, breathing Jesus in this book? And uh, that was enough of a challenge. So I spent a couple of years in the New Testament, which was enormously enjoyable. And it's, of course, it's so vivid and immediate and gripping that uh, it's the best um, its the best material any journalist could ever have to, uh, to write about. And um, so that's thats what produced this book, really. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, Fantastic. I haven't read it yet, I must confess, but my wife is reading. It only came in yesterday. So uh, we've got 
uh, the copy of the book here for those who can see me in the. I've actually got two two copies, one for me and one to give away. So I'm uh, obviously I'm a bit of a convert for uh, in in more ways than one. But my wife was reading to me the beautiful story of the new Archbishop of Sydney, how he came to Christ. Do you want to share that little quick story, insight from uh, from your book, uh, Greg? Sure, sure. And you're right to uh, advise me to be quick, Warwick, because I have a big Fidel Castro element of my personality, which, you know, I talk for hours and hours and hours. But uh, Archbishop Kanishka Raphael, the uh, Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, in writing the last book, I did an interview profile with the politician Andrew Hastie. And when Andrew was in the special forces and sent to Afghanistan, he wrote a letter to be delivered to his wife in the event of his death. And he made a request about who should take his funeral and what they should preach on. And he asked that Kanishka Raphael, who'd been the, the uh, you know, the vicar or the clergyman at his church in Perth, take his funeral and preach on Lazarus. And um, poor old Kanishka, I didn't check it with him before I wrote it or anything. And he was just reading along one day, you know, because reading about Hasty and discovered himself in the book. And I'm not sure whether he um, he got in touch with me or I got in touch with him. But in any event, we caught up for a meal and a cup of coffee and one thing and another. We became good friends. And when I came to write this book, the story of his conversion is so gripping. So he was born in Sri Lanka and uh, born and brought up a Buddhist. And he was uh, finishing high school when some friends of his said, look, would you just read one thing for us about Christianity? And he expected it to be a book by C.S. Lewis or something like that. He was quite looking forward to reading that. He was still a conscientious believing Buddhist at that time. And the thing they asked him to read was the Gospel of John. And he read it and it revolutionized his life. He read it and he read it again. He couldn't sleep that night. He read it a third time. He tried to say some prayers. The only prayers he had was, was a prayer printed in the, in the back of the Bible that he was reading from, which I think might have been a Gideon's Bible in a motel or something like that. And by morning time, and he, he encountered the real Jesus in the Gospel of John, and he was struck by what a living, breathing creature or person, I shouldn't use the word creature, what a living, breathing person Jesus was. And um, by morning time, he was a Christian. And, uh, you know, five minutes later, he wanted to give up university and um, just be a full-time volunteer in his local Christian church. And wisely, the parish uh, clergyman said to him, look, you, you're enrolled in law, why don't you finish? He finished law, did a couple of years, I think, of um, practice as a lawyer, went into the Anglican ministry, and the rest is history. He's a very gifted and brilliant man, wonderful man to be with. There's a lightness in him and a cheerfulness. Uh, I, I couldn't recommend him too highly. I hope I haven't ruined his reputation by association now, you know. And, of course, when I wrote that chapter, I, neither he nor I had any idea that he was uh, going to become Archbishop of Sydney. So you obviously have a good eye for the uh, horses, no, eh? no. and uh, well, uh, yeah, well, you know that's a that's a nice interpretation of it. I I could tell you a few stories which had the opposite outcome, but I think I'll just let let those uh, let those lie. I'm going to ask you one more question. I want to put uh, Kurt on notice, and also Kim. They might have a question. They're my fellow leaders, but um, I mean, this is actually it's a pretty full on book, three hundred and. You know, was it how many pages is it? 340, 360, 360, 360, like that, yeah. 360 pages. It's a pretty uh, hefty volume and a lot of great stories. And look, uh, as someone who aspires to be a writer, you're a phenomenal writer. But what would what would be, and this is probably a hard question, but what would be the highlight? You, you, you must have interviewed dozens and dozens of people, if not more than that, to write that book. Which, which one sort of, is anyone that sort of stand out to you? Yes, yeah, so I give you, um, I know I'm going to be real brief, but I'll give you three highlights. So the first half of the book is about the New Testament, Jesus and his first friends. And, uh, and then the second half of the book is interview profiles with contemporary Christians who are doing interesting things or who are really interesting people. Now, I have to tell you, much as I enjoyed interviewing everyone the second half of the book, the first half of the book was really just, just such a fabulous joy. And, uh, to spend the time in the Gospels and the in the writings of Paul, and uh, I was just overwhelmed by the story of the crucifixion and uh, you know the moment in the crucifixion where Jesus cries out, "I thirst." It's just so visceral, 
the moment when he's near to death and he looks down at his mother and at uh, the faithful disciple John and he says, uh, woman, this is your son. And he says to John, this is your mother. And forget the theology for a moment, just the human affection. He's in agony. He's about to die. But he's trying to look after his mother. And um, I, so one highlight was just spending a lot of time in the Gospels, not reading it verse by verse for theological input. That's a good thing to do. Christians do that. That's a great thing to do. But reading it just a book at a time, so to speak, as a journalist would read it, reading it for narrative, and then going back, of course, to the passages that are so powerful. In the second half of the book, lots of highlights about people I interviewed. Of course, ScoMo was interesting, and former Singapore Foreign Minister George Yeo, the former Labor leader, Bill Hayden. Wonderful interview. Peter Cosgrove uh, tells me about what it's like to be a Christian believer in war. You know, he saw a lot of combat in, in Vietnam and uh, how you feel about the enemy dead that you've killed, how you feel about surviving a battle. But there's one woman, Gemma Sasia, who has just devoted her life to um, education in Africa for poor kids in Tanzania. And she, um, she just went there. You know, she grew up in rural northern New South Wales up uh, beyond uh, Armadale. And she just thought she'd like to go. She did a university degree in science and just thought she'd like to go to Africa and help. So she went with a group of nuns and uh, she didn't become a nun or anything herself, but she lived with them for a while. And then she said, how would I go about starting a school? She had no building experience. She wasn't even a qualified teacher. She had a university degree. And now she runs the three most magnificent schools devoted entirely to poor kids, named in honour of St. Jude, the patron saint of hopeless causes. And she is just such a positive, radiant uh, person. And I think she doesn't really like talking about herself that much or anything, but that's all part of fundraising for the school. And I really, and I write in the book that at the end of interviewing her, I felt proud to be a human being. I thought our, our species can't be too bad if it produces uh, people like Gemma Cecile. Wow, it's amazing. Actually, it's funny, I've just read, I've read that part of the book. It's quite amazing. So I've got a colleague here online. He's, writ he's written a book. It's not dissimilar to yours. It's probably more of a cultural foray and historical foray over the last three or 400 years and sort of where things are going, and it's called Crossing Culture. Kurt, have you got a question? Because you are going to do a review of this man's book. I think you've ordered your copy too. Is that right, Kurt? I have. Great to be with you, Greg. Thanks so much for joining us. My copy of your book arrived in the mail today, um, so I'm really excited to read it. I uh, loved God is Good for You. And, um, you. yeah, I think uh, you and I are probably very much on the same page on a, on a whole range of issues. And so I'm really looking forward to reading this one. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've got a long list of questions I'd love to ask you, but probably the one that I, um, that I will ask is um, your, your two books, I love the subtitles, so The Urgent Case for Jesus in Our World and yeah. also um, A Defense of Christianity in Troubled Times. Um, there's a real sense of kind of urgency in those subtitles. And you talked a lot about the past and, and about the present in the previous book. And I, um, I'm thinking it's probably going to be similar with, with this book. But in terms of the future, what are your thoughts on Australia's trajectory, spiritually speaking, culturally speaking? Because, you know, Jesus has um, played a huge role in the past, is playing a big role in the present. But what does it look like in the future from where you stand? Well, Kurt, thank you so much. And look, I hope, Kurt and Warwick, that we're still good friends after you've read this book. I hope you don't get up to page 200 and say, oh, no, what a mistake that was. This is <laughs> terrible. Um, it's uh, So I tried in both books not to be left versus right and not to have a culture wars element to it, but to try to be... Um, so I am naturally a very combative person and I don't shy away from political... Uh, stouches and, you know, in my day job, I'm a foreign editor. I deal with fun topics like the Communist Party of China and defence budgets and so on. But um, I do think Christianity is having a rough time in the West at the moment. We are not, we shouldn't exaggerate what a rough time we're having. We're not persecuted like Christians in China or Christians in Pakistan or Christians in lots of Africa. The culture is unsympathetic to us and we're subject to a lot of ridicule and mockery and defamation, but that's different from having people come by your house and scrawl in for Nazarene on it and come back and shoot you uh, the next day. So we're not persecuted, but the culture is against us. One of the marvellous anecdotes uh, that someone told me in the book, 
uh, the Reverend Nicky Gumbel, the Anglican pastor at um, Holy Trinity Brompton, the, the progenitor of the Alpha Course, he said, you know, and a number of Christian leaders said this to me, the church has had rough times in the past. In 1750, he told me, in St Paul's Cathedral in London, there were 16 worshippers at the Easter services and there were 10,000 sex workers walking the streets of London and the church looked as though it was finished. And then along came the Wesleys and Wilberforce and, you know, the whole of England caught fire with belief and revival and um, millions upon millions of people came to God. So I think that in a way, now we know we have the, the guarantee of Christ who said, uh, you know, this is I'm founding the church through you and, the gate, and I guarantee to you the gates of hell will never prevail against you. Mm. We also know, so times like this, historically, Christian churches have often done very clever things, very clever things. Some of the people I interview in the second half of the book are leading new Christian movements, sort of building up new grassroots movements that's full of green shoots, wonderful young person, Frances Cantrell, trying to lead her generation, woman in her 20s, trying to lead her generation back to a real understanding of love and purpose and human dignity. Mm. And uh, I can't predict what the future holds, but, uh, you know, I, I do believe that basically if God needs hands in the world, they're our hands, and if he needs, you know, eyes, they're our eyes, and all of us need to do our best and trust to God. And I do think that... Uh, the Christian community in the West will will revive. Peter Cosgrove said that to me. He believes there will be the revival of Christianity in the West. Um, we have to work as though it all depends on us and pray as though it all depends on God. That's a cliche. I apologise for uttering it. but I, I, I think it's a Wesley think, quote even. I think it's a Wesley well, quote. Well, it's a great, great sign of Wesley's in, um, wisdom. There's another lovely line of Wesley that I love. Uh, he says, if you... If you catch, if you set yourself on fire with enthusiasm, people will come from miles around to watch you burn. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I, I think there's something wonderful in that. But, um, I, you know, there's the other thing now, final thought I wanted to get to is that there is a deep constituency in every human heart and soul for the truth. There, there's, we're fallen creatures. There's wickedness, a temptation to wickedness in all of us. But there is also a deep constituency for the truth. So if you're trying to tell the truth, you start with an advantage, which the other side doesn't have. So there's no reason for us ever to be uh, pessimistic, I think, about the outlook. And who would have thought we'd have a practicing uh, evangelical Pentecostal Christian as our prime minister? I mean, mm. God is more cunning than his enemies, and he finds many ways to get into human hearts and... Um, you know, you. I, I'd just say there's, I'm an Irishman, situation desperate, advance on all fronts. <laughs> I love it. That's uh, awesome to hear those encouraging thoughts, um, Greg. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Kurt. Mm. Have you got another question, Kurt? Uh, I guess, um, you know, being a writer and an author myself, I'm, I'm curious, particularly with a role as big as yours, Greg, how do you fit being a foreign editor and a journalist and writing a book into your life, not only a book, but seven over the last um, decade or however long it's been. This is number eight, uh, Kurt. Number eight, yeah. sorry. Well, I'd have to tell you honestly, uh, and this sounds terribly lame and terribly twee, but I tell you it is absolutely the bare truth. Uh, I would accomplish nothing without the efforts of my wife, mm. absolutely nothing. So I got married uh, 28 years ago. I'd actually had a book contract, but luckily the publisher had gone out of business before I'd failed to produce the manuscript. And um, I was an inherently very disorganised uh, bachelor. And um, I'm not sure that my wife would always want me to keep writing books, but when I commit to a book, she helps me enormously. Not only do I talk everything over with her, but Everything is organised. I'm organised, whereas I'm inherently disorganised. I work hard, whereas, whereas I'm inherently lazy. And it's just, you know, the joy of, the, of, of being married to my wife is just a miracle. And, um, and she allows me to get, uh, to get um, good, value out of, uh, good value out of time, even though I'm inherently very disorganised. 
journalism is a great profession for me and for certain sort of people, people who can never really go on from undergraduate life at university, you know. <laughs> you, you have to have deadlines. I'm terrible. If I have a long deadline, you know, if, if somebody says you've got a month to do this, then on the 30th day I'll begin. And uh, whereas if they say it's got to be done today, then I'll use the whole day to do it. And uh, although I worked for two or three years on this book, off and on, I ultimately took a break to write it of, of about two and a half months. And um, the contract was to write 80,000 80, words, no more than 90,000, came in at about 110,000 and we trimmed it to 105. And it was a very intense couple of months. And I had to get a certain amount of words written every, every day or every week. That was the only way to do it. You know, a big mm -hmm. task. You just break it down into lots of little tasks. Anyway, that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about me. Oh, no, that's great. Fascinating. Oh, it is. Yeah, no, no, that was great. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating, especially for us writers, isn't it, Kurt? Um, Definitely. Wonderful boy. Kim, Kim Farnak, you, you'd like to ask ask a question for Greg? Yeah, what Noel was saying, it must be good to have a wonderful wife. Um, <laughs> that's my wife. She's wonderful as well. Uh, first of all, thank you for your work. Thank you for your books. Um, it's uh, really fantastic. What you model, and this is what I want to talk a little bit and put a question to, is what I call a lifestyle um, witness. Jesus really gave us three big commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then go and make disciples or taught ones of all nations. And while not all of us evangelists, we are all called to be a witness. A witness is someone that tells a story, gives evidence. Um, and in that regard, I really, really am grateful to you, Greg, for modeling, just showing Christianity as you go in your daily life. And would you like to comment on the sort of people you're engaging with and how you engage with them? A lot of people on here who pray and quite a few are active in sharing their faith, but I know others may struggle a little bit in sharing their faith so what's your method journey way of um, sharing your faith with people in what can be a diverse and even in some cases an adversarial uh, workplace well kim uh, i really appreciate those comments journalism itself is a pretty friendly workplace really that, that sounds strange we journalists are very tough on everybody else we're very easy on each other and ourselves um, we're terrible hypocrites really but on the other hand, journalists are all, all aware of their own tremendous fallibilities and failings. And um, even when they seem to be terribly arrogant and dogmatic. And in any newsroom, you know, there's a very diverse set of human behaviour and human human beings. And, um, and, you know, people do all kinds of strange things. Going to church is not the strangest uh, of, of all of the things that you'll find in any contemporary newsroom. Um, but to answer your question more seriously, I've always been a believing Christian. I've had a lot of trouble living up to any element of, uh, of Christian ethics. And, of course, one thing that makes you a bit reluctant to be too public is you don't want Christianity judged by the sort of ramshackle qualities of your own life. But it was really partly, um, and so occasionally in newspaper columns in the past, before these last three books, I would, you know, make some remark in favour of Christianity or write about some book or something. And so people knew that that was my general uh, general disposition. But when I saw the culture become so hostile to Christianity, and then when I went to all those writers' festivals and I was quite stunned, very nice people and everything, they were very kind to me, but I was absolutely stunned at the assumption implicit in their, in their culture there that Christianity was finished, had nothing to say, uh, was yesterday's story, wasn't even worth rebutting. And if you did see anything about Christianity, it'd just be a book by one of the new atheists saying God is not great or something like that. But you wouldn't, you hardly even see that, you know, it just it just didn't exist. And then I thought, well, you know, if if circumstance and luck has given you a public microphone, it's a bit cowardly not to use it at all, not even to make the most minimal um declaration. I mean, who is the guy in John's gospel who goes to claim Jesus' body afterwards and help the burial? Is it, um, is it Joseph of Arimathea? And uh, so he wasn't all that brave. When Jesus was being crucified, he didn't come forward. But after he had been crucified and was dead, 
he was kind of ashamed of his own cowardice and silence. And at least he went forward to to um, honour Jesus' body. And I've always had a great feeling for Joseph of Arimathea because I identify with his cowardice and I also identify with just being impelled by mere self-respect to stand by your friend, especially after he's dead and the whole world is against him. And this is before Jesus is risen. So I think there's, a, you know, before he's had that encouragement. So I really have a soft spot for him. So I thought, well, I ought to say something about it. And then I had an incident on a plane. I was, I used to take all these Christian books with me everywhere to do my research. And I put them down in a way that you couldn't see the title. And then I thought, well, how pathetic is this? You know, are you really ashamed of reading a book about God? I mean, how dismal is that? So then I would turn them over so that they could be seen. And on one flight, a woman from the across the aisle said to me, I'm very interested in those books that you've got there. What What's your connection with Christianity? And it turned out she was a member of the Salvation Army, uh, one of the ranks who didn't wear a uniform. And so for five minutes, we had some solidarity. She encouraged me and I encouraged her. And I thought, well, how pathetic would it have been if I hadn't turned the book over that she wouldn't have even known there was someone else on the plane who shared her beliefs and then I wouldn't have got the terrific encouragement from her. And then, of course, once you do kind of come out, um, you know, Australians basically are broadly accepting. You know, some people will always be hostile to Christianity, but you just say, well, there it is. You know, I'm not confessing to be a child murderer or anything. I'm confessing to be a Christian. I believe in... Uh, Jesus Christ is the son of God, the resurrection, the four last things, all the rest of it. And um, I have found on the whole people to be quite okay about it. You know, even people who are not remotely believe Christians enjoy the solidarity. Uh, some of them might pick a fight with you over, you know, you got this doctrine wrong or that doctrine wrong. Very little of that, but you get a little bit of that. But generally they enjoy the solidarity and non-Christians quite a lot of them are quite interested. So they say, oh, so you claim the New Testament was actually written within 100 years or less of, of Jesus. That's interesting. I thought it came hundreds of years later. And so you you have these interesting discussions. And um, and then finally, I have the impulse of a journalist to tell a good story. Now, it kind of took me 40 years to work out what the best story was, but, you know, better to get there eventually than, uh, than, than never at all. So those are my disordered thoughts, uh, Kim, on that subject. I appreciate that. Excellent. Back to you, Warwick. Yeah, look, um, we might we, we really want to pray for um, the, the look. The big we've got two hundred, I think two hundred and sixty people here. So about three times what we normally have, Greg. So obviously um, people love you, um, but we really want to before the night's finished. While you're here with us, we'd love to just, all of us could join to pray for this book and ask God to really get it out there because the COVID's making it hard for him. Normally, he'd be running around doing a lot of stuff and getting a lot of mileage, but Literally, it's uh, it's it's difficult for Greg to get the message of this new book out. So we're going to ask God to really amplify it. And I just think there's incredible stories in here, and it's an incredible uh, story of faith. You can see that uh, our dear brother Andrew Bolt um, was really touched by it. And, uh, you know, so I'd suggest it's a phenomenal tool uh, if you want to share the love of Christ with people. And, and Greg's writing it from a journalistic perspective, um, but a friendly one nonetheless. So there might be three questions from people because we've got to pray. We can't, we've got to um, budget the time. We've got to pray for this book. Anyone got a question from the floor? I have to unmute and just uh, say your name and throw out your question. Hi, Greg. Um, thank you. Um, I've read your book, your first one, not the second one, but I will purchase that one. Um, coming from my background um, in a public um, sector, which I can't even name because these days um, your registration's put on the line when you say you're a Christian. Um, and, I, I mean, I find it quite encouraging um, that there are people that are, are allowed, like their registration doesn't um, prohibit them from talking out about Christianity. So... Um, what do you think, um, like, how you can encourage, like, nurses and doctors that our faith in the public sector is particularly curtailed by APRA? Yes, look, I, I think that's a very serious situation. It's one I don't have really detailed knowledge of, but 
I, I, I think people who are effectively curtailed from expressing their Christianity, that's a terrible thing. One thing I argued in the last book was that all Christian institutions should own their own Christianity. So if there's a hospital which says it's a Christian hospital or a school which says it's a Christian school or, or a, you know, a social welfare organisation which grew out of a church, it should, I'm not really sort of trying to give them hard running orders, but in, in whatever way is appropriate to itself, it should own its public Christianity. The more people who just own their Christianity publicly, and everybody's style is different. You know, some people are declaratory, some people are, are shy, some people are kind of a bit indirect, uh, some people have a great sense of humour, some people are very serious. You know, I've got three sons, and at, at first I thought they were all just less interesting versions of me, but it turned out they were more interesting versions of completely different people, and they couldn't be less like each other. You know, they're all, they're all so different. But the more people who own their Christianity publicly, the harder it is to proscribe other Christians from, from participating, you know. Uh, uh, but if, if people need some, it, it may be that people need protection in the law. I haven't really looked deeply into that. And uh, given the, the wide range of views that are now committed, <laughs> you know, really strange views very often, you know, you can advocate for Satanism and witchcraft and all kinds of crazy things. The idea that, uh, you know, a Christian would be prevented from owning their own Christianity in public. I can imagine there are roles where you're not meant to uh, proselytise somebody who's come to you for a service or something. OK, oh, that's that's fair enough, you know. And some readers strongly object to me writing about Christianity in Australia. And they say, look, that's, you're meant to be the foreign editor. Get back to business, you know, mind your P's and Q's. But um, uh, so I, I don't have anything much more direct for you than that, except that I, I encourage everyone as far as they can within prudence to just be public about their Christianity if they can. Uh, Jesus Sorry. is a foreigner to the point that he's not even from this planet. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Janine. One, uh, two more questions. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, uh, this Greg, uh, I was surprised this con Michael Edis, uh, I haven't read your book, but I've read your excerpts in the Australian, and that actually surprised me that they were too, I, I've only read it on the, on the weekend, I don't know if they've been there during the week as well, but just on the weekend Australian, two, two weeks running, there were excerpts from your book, and I thought, that's, that's amazing, it's, it's so wonderful, but uh, is this... Um, do you think that's sort of a sign of a change in acceptance in the culture, or is this something, an internal thing? You've got, you've got friends in there. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I've worked at The Australian for a very long time. I've been there for 37 years, so um, they, they're pretty familiar with me by now. But uh, I do have a chapter on, on Christianity in popular culture in this book, which I'd love you to read, because I think it was, it is, I think it is a little bit better than it was five years ago, say. So there are a couple of TV series and a couple of movies and a number of popular novels that I write about, which are very pro-Christian. And that's very surprising where, and I think five years ago, that was probably, so it may be that we reached the low point of anti-Christian animus in the popular culture with the Australian. Um, so they ran three extracts from the book, a colour magazine extract on mainly on Scott Morrison, then a, a, um, an extract from the chapter on Paul, in Monday, and then an extract from the chapter on Mary on Saturday. But really, The Australian is just a wonderful, uh, wonderful newspaper. We have a number of columnists who are pretty clearly uh, Christian in their inspiration and outlook. Uh, they don't write about religion all the time, people like Angela Shanahan and so on. And, um, you know, it's my book, the paper's being very nice to me about it. But also the readers tell you, we, we, can, me we can measure now uh, who reads you know, how many page views you get for each article and so on. And my stuff on Christianity, you know, generally is, is quite healthy in, in the number of readers it gets. So it would be a bit harder for me to argue the case for writing these pieces if, if nobody read them. Some of them are very well read and some of them are respectively <clears throat> read, but that's enough. And the, and the paper, you know, journalism in any event is full of haunted Christians, you know, haunted Christians and lapsed Christians and ex-Christians and so on. And very few of them, are, some of them are really hostile to Christianity. 
most of them are what you call good bad Christians. They understand that their life doesn't conform to um, to the truth, but they don't want the truth abolished as a result. You know, I'm not talking about any of my colleagues specifically there, but um, but you'll know the category of person I mean. Uh, James Hare, thank you. Uh, my name's Reverend Dr. Julia Pittman. I'm married to James Hare, and I'm the minister at St Paul's and Armitage United Churches in Mackay. I've read your book, the first one, and reviewed it, and sent you a copy of the review for the Uniting Church for the Historical Society. My question is about the Religious Discrimination Bill and the fact that it's been shelved. What are your views on whether it's necessary and how quickly it should be implemented, if at all? So, look, thank you very much for that. I remember that review, and uh, I remember that I wrote a really beautiful reply to you in my head and never actually, uh, never actually sent it. And if I could only publish my unwritten um, letters of thanks and appreciation, um, I'd be a much better man that I am. But the, the best things that I think of, think of doing seldom move from my head to actual, uh, to actual action. So I'm very torn about the Religious Freedom Bill. Uh, I haven't studied it, but I think that it is necessary, but I think that it is also full of pitfalls and very difficult to execute. I've got friends in politics who are on both sides of this argument who are believing Christians. I've got friends in politics who are believing Christians who think you cannot write a bill like this, which will not in the end make things worse. It, it will either uh, be exploited by extremists who will call themselves uh, religious believers, um, or it will lead to judges deciding what religious belief is and deciding that, you know, this religious belief is protected and that religious belief is not. Um, and that it could well end up with religious freedom being more curtailed. So that's one argument. The reverse argument is that there are clearly cases where religious freedom is being actively curtailed today, you know, where schools and hospitals and adoption agencies and so on are not allowed to practice the Christian faith as they've always practiced it and still be okay with the regulators. And you need to, to protect them. And uh, I honestly think I'm very torn. I'd have to see the specifics of the legislation and I'd want competent Christian lawyers to try to work through how it's actually going to apply. I think we need it. I don't know that we can do it well. Thank you. It's a very good answer. It is, it's a difficult one. And uh, Kurt and I and Kim and many others here on this call have, have wrestled with it. And uh, the ideal way would be to find a way to go back to common law presumption of religious freedom, which mm. for some strange reason we seem to have uh, have lost, but we won't go there for the moment. Suffice to say, the most important thing we can do is to pray a blessing on this dear man's work. And uh, Kim, what do you reckon? Shall we just get a few people to pray? Yeah, I think I think we're time wise. Yes, uh, right. I really. Again, appreciate time, Greg. It's uh, quite a long, long uh, time, but and appreciate the questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we should pray. Um, well, do you want to uh, kick us off, Kim, uh, I, and and uh, maybe just a few people? Um, we can't have everyone pray. Look, look, this is fantastic. We welcome everyone tonight, by the way, and uh, two fifty people. It's amazing. But we'd really like to see. Who would love to just give me a wave? You'd like to see this book really just sell in tens and tens of thousands. Um, it's a book about Jesus. It's glorifying Jesus. It's the urgent case for Jesus in our world, very well argued. And, um, you know, I just think it would be great to see this get out there. So who would like to pray? I'll kick off and then you can close okay, maybe and then we'll have a few okay. others. Papa God, we, uh, we thank you for Greg and the work that he's done. But this is in a, in a simplistic form, it's just another way of sharing and lifting up the name of Jesus in this wonderful nation of Australia, that it would relate to people who wouldn't normally give it a second thought, but it'd be a, a way for your truth, your life to be shared with people that are in desperate need of you. This nation is in desperate need of you. And so we bless this book. We bless Greg, his family. Uh, we bless all of the activities around this that this book would connect and proclaim the name of Jesus in Australia. So we yeah. bless you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. A couple other people. Guess he's got a hand up. 
Thank you, Neil. Jesse Tan, you'd like to pray? Have to unmute first, though, my sister. You've, you've muted yourself again, Jesse, unfortunately, so you'll have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Off you go. Okay. Father, we just thank you for Greg. Thank you that you've given him the voice to share in this climate, in the, the land that we call Australia, our home. We pray that your voice will go forth with his and you bless him and this book so that it will bring us clarity and boldness and that more will join him, Lord. It will add voice to bring you glory and bring love to all those who hear your voice. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Jesse. A few others, a couple others. Lord God, we thank you for all the people that are reading the newspaper that have had an introduction to Greg over all these years, Father. And I thank you for his long history with the paper and its friendliness toward him that they publish his works and indeed promote this book, Father. And I just pray that double, triple, quadruple numbers of this book will get out there and it will start a conversation that people will um, discuss it everywhere they go and ask each other if they've read it. Read it. Discuss it and understand it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Someone else? Father, we thank and you. Father, Fred, Fred, could you go first and then Fiona? Father, we thank you for your spirit, for your amazing spirit, and we pray now in Jesus' precious name that you would use your mighty spirit to use this vehicle of Greg's book to reach many people in this nation yeah. and outside yeah. this nation as well. We thank you for this vehicle. We thank you for Greg's heart. We thank you for all the work he's put into it. And we mm -hmm. do ask now that you would come with power and you would Amen. come Amen. and convince many people that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. 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 Yeah. Fiona. Oh, Father, I stand, Father, I stand, I stand with the prayers of my brothers and sisters. sisters. <laughs> And, and in the one that's been just prayed by Fred, and I just pray, Father, that many more like Andrew Bolt will have their um, logic and challenged and with the evidence that's been provided in the book. Father, I look forward to reading it myself and look forward to sharing it with others. And I just pray that your hand would be upon its distribution and that you'd be putting it into the hands of those who need this challenge, I pray in Jesus' name. And thank you. I just bless um, Greg and his wife and his work in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One more prayer. <laughs> yes, thank you, Father, for that opportunity. We, we declare that you will go forward ahead of this book and put in the hearts of Aussies to love the truth. Jesus said for this. Amen reason I was born and came into the world, that people that I testify to the truth and all who love the truth will recognize that what I say is true. So, Father, I speak that out into the spirit realm that many would seek truth, love truth, and find it in this book and ultimately salvation through Jesus. Thank you, Greg. So I'll just pray uh, as we finish this prayer part, uh, but we'll have a little chit-chat for those who want to stay on a little bit afterwards. Father, I just thank you for Greg. I thank you for his passion for you. Thank you for his passion for truth. Uh, thank you for his passion, Lord, for humility, Lord God. We pray now that you'll honour this, these deep passions and that you'll just bless this book in an ex extraordinary way. In Jesus' name we pray this. Bless his wife, bless his family, uh, bless him in his work. Um, and, uh, Lord, we just pray commit this to you, this book particularly to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on behalf of everybody here, Greg, uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, we appreciate your uh, coming with us, to be with us tonight. We know you're a pretty busy guy and um, with lots of deadlines, and we just appreciate the fact you'd come and share with us. I've got a question, just a last question. With the, the, the number of books sold with the last book, which was the biggest selling of the, of the last seven books up till this eighth book now, how many copies did it end up selling as of today or, you know, the last few weeks? It's whenever not, you get your... 
So Warwick, first of all, thank you very much for the experience of this evening and thank you very much to everyone who's involved tonight and thank you very much for your prayers and God knows I need the prayers, so thank you very much altogether. Um, the last book is still selling and it's having a revival with this book, but it's uh, it's just a tick under 30,000, uh, which is uh, very unusual for a, um, for a, a non-fiction, you know, relatively serious book. So, certainly better. So look, let me be quite clear. This is not Harry Potter. It's not going to sell a million copies and change the, the destiny of the nation. But, you know, um, 10,000 is a bestseller in Australia, 30,000 on a per capita basis, a similar sale in the United States would be half a million or something. So I, honestly, I'm not saying that in any kind of weirdly boastful spirit, but just as an expression of gratitude that, uh, that um, you know, people were so kind to the book. And as I say, the thing is, find a field where there are no other participants at all. That's uh, that's the key. But thank you so much for everything. I'm really grateful. So the, the reason that we're going to pray for double anointing, Elijah had the, the privilege of being doubly anointed. So 30,000 goes to 60. So that's what we're praying for, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Warwick. Thank you yeah, very so, much indeed. So God bless you. And um, you might, is anyone... We, we, we're officially finished, but anyone would like to thank Greg for his last book or anything you'd like just to encourage him with, because it's always nice to get a bit of encouragement from uh, from people in the real world. Anyone want to say anything to Greg as we finish today, tonight? Yeah, I'd like to say this. I'd like to say this to you, Greg. You've heard this again, so please forgive this. This I'd rather a cliche statement. You're for such a time as this. God's got it. God raising up spokespeople and is anointing for creativity in the world that God is increasing in, and God's raised you up for such a time as this with your books. So, you know, be fearsome. Don't be afraid of their faces and keep speaking out. And God protect and, and shield you and bless you. Amen. Amen. Oh, I believe I said, what she said is 100% Sharon's a very faithful woman of prayer, and I do believe that she's right. God has raised you up for such a time as this, which are the words that were spoken over Esther in the book of Esther. I'm sure you're familiar with them. And God's using you and many others like you to uh, trumpet Christ and look at look what's happened uh, in the Olympics. Uh, Kurt, is how many uh, medal holders are Christian? I think you counted thirty two. Is that right, Kurt? Yeah, there's probably a few more to be honest. Though I couldn't get information on all of them, so I'm I'm currently writing an article, and it's probably going to be about twenty or twenty five Christian athletes who not only won medals but spoke openly about their faith and you know gave glory to God. So um, yeah, I more than any Olympics I remember, and I'm sure I paid attention in the past, but this year in particular, uh, Christians are extremely bold in sharing about their faith and the way God has guided them to the Olympics and to victory. So keep your eyes out for that article in the next couple of days. So, so Greg's an Olympic runner for, uh, for, for the gospel in the area, not of um, running 100 metres, but, but writing uh, phenomenal books. So uh, we just believe him for a couple of gold medals for you too there, Greg. <laughs> Anyone else like to say anything? Yes. yes. I, would, I would love to bless. <laughs> Could I bless you, Greg? I want to bless you with courage. I want to bless you with boldness and that say, I think you've only just begun. There's more in you and that the Lord would bless you and keep you. <laughs> You've just muted yourself, Hillary. We don't want to miss on these wonderful words. Hillary, you have to unmute. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to bless Greg and just say to him that I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I sense that you've only just begun, that there's more books in you. There's more that God's going to inspire you and that he will give you such joy in this process. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength and you'll be a yeah. contagious Christian. And I pray that these books, people will start opening them and they won't be able to put them down until they finish them. And these pages, the anointing of the Lord Jesus will be upon them. And that Lord will give you peace in it all. I pray for revelation. I pray for inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And I pray for your wonderful sense of humor that will be able to be um, the, the vehicle through which so many Australians can connect and realise this isn't religious, miserable, legalistic rubbish. This is life. <laughs> this is light. And this is wonderful. <laughs> and I just really bless you in this. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Um, I'd so like much. to add to that, Greg. Um, I see you running as, um, you know, an Olympian throwing a javelin. And I see you as throwing a javelin, but may you be winsome in your throwing and may you be direct in your hitting. Um, the Lord bless you, mighty man. Amen. I'd like to say that, that I don't read a lot of books, but this is one of my favourites. And I keep dipping into it. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And I've actually debated with one of Sydney's leading agnostic humanists on community radio with it. And Philip Adams gave it a plug. And I sent a copy of the, of the debate to Helen Garner as well. So Greg might find that encouraging. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's great. That's okay. great. Can I say something? Johnny wants to speak. Johnny's Hello. from the Pacific Islands, yes. uh, Greg. I, I just want to say a little... Uh, <laughs> is, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit want me to read this for you. Psalm 45, verse 1 and 2. Heart is stirred by a noble theme as a pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. This is your blessing, my brother. May the Lord take you and lift you up and favor you beyond for his name's sake. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. So there's a, there's a whole verse in the Bible all about you, Greg. It's in Psalm <laughs> 145, <laughs> verses 1 and 2. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, Gordon. Okay. What I'd like to say is I really appreciate the way you honored your wife. That is something which is really missing in our current situation because what is happening is that either men are put up or women are put up and here you are working in a partnership which both of you need the other and both of you have worked together. This is just as much a testimony of the presence of God and Christ in that family as anything else that I've heard. And I would 100% agree with that. I'm sure everyone here would give this man a clap for his words and it's the beauty of Christ. If I can just uh, give a scripture and maybe a couple other people want, want to just, uh, we're going to have to finish pretty soon, but maybe a couple other people like to say something for Greg. But Greg, you must know the scripture in Ephesians. It says, uh, it talks about, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and the two shall become one. And this is the mystery of Christ and the church. So you're actually, you and your, you and your wife working together, your wife supporting you and sacrificing, obviously, your her time with you, but supporting you to get this book finished. And it's a pretty hefty book, like it's 110,000 words. I mean, it's a pretty full on book. And uh, in, there's a beautiful testimony, as my our dear brother Gordon said, of uh, the grace of Jesus. Is that right, Gordon? Yep, absolutely. And it, what, what is really interesting is that without, without her, he couldn't do it. With her, they, they, they work together. And they, they produce something, and this this really is the essence of a marriage. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's incredibly. Thanks for bringing that up, Gordon. Anyone else? Two more, quickly. Me? Can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Katrina, I I just uh, I'm so excited about this book, and I'm so excited. I think I think Andrew Bolt is on the verge of finding Jesus. Does Scott Morrison have a copy of this book? <laughs> I, yes, well, he, I, I sent him a PDF um, and uh, I sent him a, uh, uh, I checked all the quotes with him, but I'm, I'm sure that he has a, uh, I'm, I'm sure that he has a physical copy now. He's, he's been very kind about it. He's been very kind about it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And again, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's been a very special night with so many people joining us. Uh, and thank you uh, to all those who have joined us and listened. And we are hoping to we'll put this up on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, and obviously, we want to share this good news about this book. So go to the we've actually put up um, the, um, the the Sky News, which was sort of hidden, if you like. It was we got it from Facebook and put it up. I'm sure we, we give them a bit of credit to Sky News in the process, but certainly share that link with people and uh, tell people about this wonderful book, a book about Jesus in our culture. It's great stories and great testimonies. So, Greg, 
a uh, huge, huge thank you. Uh, God's blessings to you. And I might ask Kurt to close us off with prayer tonight. Kurt Melberg. Sounds great. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather tonight. Um, it's been such an edifying night hearing from Greg and um, also being able to encourage him. Lord, we are just so deeply thankful for Greg and for people like him in our world and particularly in our country who are speaking the truth and using their gifts to glorify you. And we're particularly thankful, God, that you've placed Greg in this um, very secular environment, but with a, a really wide readership and a lot of respect from um, the Australian population. And yeah, we just praise you for that gift that you've given him and, um, and for the way that he is stewarding that and using his platform to speak of you. God, we just really ask that over these coming weeks and months, this book would be read far and wide. I pray especially that um, those who would normally find themselves in Greg's readership uh, but are not people of faith, that they would stumble upon this book, whether directly or by people uh, giving them or lending them a copy. Lord, they're just the people I know that you have uh, planned out to, to read this book, and I'm sure they're the people that Greg had on his heart as he researched and wrote uh, this book. And so we just pray, Father, that it would make it into the hands of those people and that it would transform hearts and lives Lord, we want to uh, see individual people come back to you uh, because at the end of the day, um, this life is eternal and we are just on this earth for a little blip. But Lord, we also have a heart for our culture and for our nation. And we really pray that through the transfer transformation of individual hearts that you would transform Australia and bring us back to Christ, bring us back to righteousness, bring us back to revival and reformation and the sort of culture and the sort of society that blesses everyone and uh, is yeah, just an awesome place for freedom, for faith to be practiced, uh, for tolerance to be extended in every direction and for prosperity and joy, just the way that you've intended life to be. Uh, we pray all of these things and really bless Greg and the sale of this book um, from now on in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless Thanks you. Kurong, Kurong's got it on, on sale at twenty nine ninety five. Greg, I'm pretty sure. Um, That's right. So, uh, you know, Kurong's uh, Kurong website, it's up there in the chat. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg. Thanks, Warwick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.